All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Correct loser i hope you're doing well so folks today we're gonna go over the rust movie set shooting incident over the past couple days i watched all the interrogations all of the body cam footage some of that body cam footage of law enforcement showing up and talking to hannah right away is unforgettable i read every article i could get my hands on i had had some major gaps in my understanding of what happened with this one and as i filled those gaps in a haunting picture is painted that's the story I'm going to tell you guys today. So sit back, pour yourself a cup of coffee strong enough to kill a horse, and let's get into it. First, I'm going to start by telling you about a man named Thel Reed. Thel, for the past generation, has been one of the, if not the, most respected armorers in the Hollywood movie industry. Very quickly, I know a lot of people know, what is an armorer? It's simple. It's the person hired by the movie production to be the gun safety expert. So what does that look like? Say I get hired as an armorer for the next big cool movie. I got the job. Nice. So first, I would talk the, to the director, and we would decide what guns are needed for this production. Maybe I got a couple guns in my own private collection. I've been an armorer for a while. I've built up a decent collection of movie guns, whatever I don't have in my own collection. There's companies that you can rent movie guns from. So I procure all of the guns needed and then I would get the ammo that we needed. So there's two types of movie ammo, a blank, which doesn't look like a real bullet because there's no projectile on the top. The top is just sort of pinched together, but there is gunpowder in it. If you put it in a gun and pull the trigger there is an explosion there's a loud noise just like a gunshot fire shoots out the barrel smoke shoots out there's levels of blanks so if an actor is outside and there's the, another actor's face isn't close to the gun can put in more of a powerful blank bigger explosion more fire out the barrel looks more real but if an actor's inside it's going to blow everyone's ears out or there's another actor's face close by you can dial down the power of the blank but again a blank makes the sound they are dangerous because you can blow someone's ear off you can surprise someone you can scare them you can burn them you could hurt their eyes alex said in his interrogation i don't know if this is true but he said an actor a long time ago didn't know there was a blank in a gun put it to his head and pulled the trigger and even though there was no projectile just the force killed him so that's a blank then the other type of round is a dummy bullet which is just a prop bullet so if a revolver needs to look like it has bullets in it you would put dummies in because for the scene you don't need the actual gunshot sound and look or for gun belts how cowboys have bullets in their gun belt you would put dummy rounds in that dummy rounds actually do have the top projectile that in a real bullet would separate from the casing and go off and hurt or target shoot or the dummy bullet does have that projectile tile on the top but there's no gunpowder or anything in but since it does look exactly like a normal bullet because it's a prop bullet what is how do you know it's not a normal bullet well there's a fail safe method they put bb's inside of them and so a real bullet that has gunpowder that will the projectile will explode off and potentially hurt somebody they don't shake. There's, there's no BBs inside of them. So the fail-safe method is for a dummy bullet. Is this a real bullet or a dummy bullet? I've got to put it in the prop gun. You shake it. If you can feel the, the uh, BBs dinging around and hear them dinging around, it is definitely a dummy bullet. So I maybe I have some of those as the new armor for the next big cool movie. Maybe I have a couple boxes of dummy bullets. Maybe I have some blanks, but I got to get more. Same company. I can order them from them. So I get all of the guns and all of the ammo needed for that production. And then it's my job to safely store everything organized. Um, if there's a lot of guns on a movie, there's a they'll put a gun safe at the movie set. So we'll lock everything up, make sure everything is organized correctly if there's just maybe like one gun on the set the armor might i was in a play once years and years ago where we had one gun uh, it was the play was all my sons and the dad kills sorry for the spoiler the play came or was written in 1947 so you've had time but the dad kills himself in the final scene and at first the production of the play they were just going to have the gun 
shot be a sound effect coming out through the speakers in the theater and then it wasn't it didn't sound real enough for him or it wasn't hit and so then they switched it to they got an armorer and so the armorer would come with this little locked briefcase every night and get the gun out and they used a blank so at the time the armorer would shoot the blank backstage and then and the audience would jump and it had the effect they were looking for but it is a pain it's so much safety because you don't want to hurt someone you don't want to blow their ears out many injuries can happen that aren't you know death long before that and so you got to be on it the, the movie sets are long, terrible days. And so the armorer, say I get this scene, I got to get my guns ready for. I need two guns with blanks in them, one gun with just the dummy rounds. So I would go to my you know, big safe, open it up, get the guns out that are needed, make sure there's nothing in the barrels because you don't want some rock firing out like a bat out of hell. And so it's like, okay, these guns need blanks in them. So I would go to the blanks with the right amount of gunpowder. They're inside, so we're gonna, the actors are inside, so we're gonna dial that back. And I would put in the blanks, make sure I'm putting in the right ones. That's the, t the tough job, right, of, um, of an armor. It's tedious, you've been there 10 hours a day, you're getting lulled to sleep because everything's going well, but you need to sit there and go, okay, this is the right blank, this is the right blank. Okay, this gun just has dummy rounds. I gotta sit here, even though it feels ridiculous, I'm gonna shake every one of them just to make sure I've not been using the same dummy rounds for years. Why would there be a real bullet in them? But I'm just gonna do the process and shake them. Okay, so Thel Reed has been doing that job for the movies for the past generation. Slowly but surely, movie after movie built a name, a respected reputation as, like I said, one of the best. So that brings us up to modern times. And in the past couple years, Thel's daughter, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, graduated from college with a speech with a degree in speech and film. I know a little bit about that because I graduated with a degree in speech and theater. And that's one of those, it's pretty much the same. That those degrees are, unless you really got a plan, have your ducks in a row, or your parents have a connection to help you out, it's not an easy degree combo to enter the workforce. My parents, I didn't have a plan. My parents don't have any connections. So my first job was I sat in a call center and a robot dialed hundreds of numbers a minute. And if some poor bastard was unlucky enough to pick up, I would tell them that their house was getting foreclosed on in 90 days. So as you can imagine, the worst job possible. So Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is graduating from college. Her dad is this big armorer, respected. And I don't know if it was Hannah asking her dad, hey, listen, dad, I'm graduating. I don't have any plans. I'd like to get into the family business of being an armorer. Or if it was the opposite and her dad said, hey, listen, daughter Hannah, you're graduating soon. You're going to need a job. It's not easy. It's not as easy as... People think if I get a college degree, I'll be good. And um, so maybe, Hannah, maybe I could train you as an armorer and you could take up the family business. I've been able to make good money. I've been able to support the family. It hasn't been a bad way of life. So maybe go that route. And maybe she agreed. Hold on, I need a drink. But either way, as Hannah Gutierrez Reed is coming up towards graduation and graduation, the decision is made. She is getting into the family business of being an armorer in the movie business. So Hannah says in her interrogation that she did right after the incident that since she was 17 years old, she had bummed around on the set with her dad. Um, a couple times she did other jobs like assistance for other parts of the movies. She had had experience on movie sets. I don't think it's real armorer um, training or experience. But then, so like, like I said, since she was 17, she's been on the movie set, seeing her dad do the job. It's not nothing. But then when she's graduating from college, now she's 24 years old. Now they get serious. So how Thel Reed, her father, trains her for her new career in armorery. I don't know if that's the word. For her new career is... She does an intensive job shadow of his movie that he's working on. So she does one full intensive 
I guess, internship with her dad where she, she closely follows, again, times other than this when she was on the movie set. I don't think she was really trying to actually learn the gig, but this one, she worked with her dad. He taught her everything that he could, and just like that, with one movie where she helped her dad, he was the head armorer, just like that, she was ready to go, I guess, in their opinion. She gets the stamp of approval from Fell. It could have been more like, oh, I think she's ready, don't really sure, but either way, bills and life are coming down the road. She's got to start working. She's gradua graduated from college, so she's going to have to learn as she goes, but she did follow me for a full movie, that's something. So now they thought, all right, now it's Hannah's turn, the 24-year-old college graduate with speech and film with one movie following her dad under the belt, gets her first job as the head armorer on a big budget Hollywood movie. And that starts, that this whole thing so far has been prologue. Now we start with chapter one, the Nicolas Cage movie which is Hannah Gutierrez-Reed's first armor gig. And she told friends, I don't, I, she was nervous. I don't know if I am ready to take the job. I'm, I'm scared. But she takes the job. Her work on the Nicolas Cage movie was one month, four weeks, and it went absolutely terrible. In those four weeks, she had multiple major incidents. At least one, I think two people begged to have her fired. She accidentally shot off a blank on set. She didn't announce that she was coming on set with the blank that makes the really loud um, noise. And she accidentally fired one off on set. Nicolas Cage flipped out. The man's been working on movies for a really long time. He knows the etiquette. He flipped out. Why didn't you announce it? You blew my eardrums out. He walks off set. Um, Hannah, who isn't great at accepting responsibility for things she did, describes that incident as, yeah, Nicolas Cage got a little pissy because he forgot to wear his earplugs. It's like, Hannah, it's a stretch. But, um, so she fires that blank off. That's a major incident. You could be in armor for a full career and not have an incident like that. Um, another major incident that got everybody on the movie set just talking about how kind of scary and incompetent she is, is she walked on the set carrying guns in her hands and carrying more guns under her armpits, carrying a bunch of guns on. Well, there's ways you carry guns, so no matter what, they don't point at people. But the way she was carrying, they were pointing at everybody. So everyone's going, Hannah, whoa, what are you doing? What are you doing? And she's going, oh, sorry. So just in a short month, if not for the Rust movie set incident, you could describe this first movie as it couldn't have gone worse. So these incidents weren't stretched out over five years you know one every couple of years this was just one short month blew nicholas cage's ears out pointed guns at everybody and then the month was over well it's all right it's a first one you gotta dip your feet in before you can swim she said she was nervous so that month goes a little rocky and then she goes home and relaxes for a week and then she gets her second job as the Rust Armorer, which brings us to Chapter 2, Shooting at the Bonanza Ranch. And so after a tough first month, she got to relax for a week, get some rest, and then it's to the desert in New Mexico. Rust, the movie that we're talking about, shot at your classic movie ranch set out in the middle of the desert. I was thinking, you never hear anything great happening at those movie ranches in the middle of the desert. You never hear someone go, yeah, we spent time at one of those movie ranches in the desert and no one died at all, ever, while we were out there. Yeah. So they're at a movie ranch. It's one of those, you can picture it. The thing that complicated this movie set is it is in the middle of the desert and far away from a lot of the crew. A lot of the crew was from New Mexico and it instantly made the crew mad because a lot of the crew that lived in New Mexico didn't get hotels. So they'd be, they 
film for 12 hours out in the desert. You get done at 1, 2 in the morning, and then you got to drive 60 miles back to New Mexico. Some of the crew got hotels closer, but it, it, it was going rocky with the crew. The camera crew's pissed. They're going, we're driving back an hour in the middle of the night, and then we get home, and it's already 4. got to be back at 7. It's an hour back. This is not working. We need hotels. The production did not have did not have all of the money to just really do a movie they were short on money it's never a good idea they're trying to cut costs here and there and so the production company is going hey listen you sign the contract you don't get a hotel i don't know what to tell you but picture a movie crew everything that involves 12 hour days five days a week out in the middle of the desert you're going you know there's porta potties out there it's dusty it's hot it's tr- a lot of travel and um the first week for hannah so remember the first four weeks of her short career went awful all right now we are on week six, and week six also goes terrible. She said that she was yelled at numerous times. A lot of people thought she was amateur hour, and think about that. You're out in the desert. You're in this old western movie set town. There's guns going off. Maybe you're in the movie. You're a crew member. There's guns being pointed around, and you're looking at Hannah going... Is she experienced enough or is is she incompetent? I mean, she's only been working for five weeks and many people were scratching their head going, this is horrifying. Who is this? How is she in charge? And then because props are not an easy job on these period pieces. So if if you got to find a prop that is... In the right period, it looks the right way. The movie production's like, all right, you're, a, you're in charge of props. Go find the thing we need. The prop director is like, okay. And they apparently hired the prop director only a week before shooting. Usually it's a month. So the prop department was just struggling to get all the props right, to get all the actors their stuff before shooting. They were taking everybody's time up. It wasn't going well. So the movie production asked Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, who already has shown that she did not have a handle on her own job. They said, listen, you got to help with props. They're not, they're struggling. And so now you have the armorer, which is barely handling her job, now helping with other jobs, starting to stretch her thin. It's never a good idea. It never ends well. And so the first week of Rust ends with a whole bunch of drama. People are yelling at Hannah. People are yelling at the prop department. And hours before the incident that we are talking about today, the whole camera crew quits, which you could just, I mean, if they they all quit and walk out, you can just imagine what the vibe of the set was on. Say you're the production crew or say you're a producer of the movie and you're there out in the desert hoping this is a amazing movie hoping it makes millions of dollars hoping it's artistic and you're and it's just problem after problem the prop department's struggling the armor is kind of an idiot the whole the whole film the whole camera crew walked off what are we gonna do we're short on money you could see just how stressful the whole thing is the armor has been yelled at several times all right, well, that closes the first week. So then the start of week two, Alec would describe it as, hey, listen, the camera crew walked off. They had agreed to their contract of they had to drive home at the end of the night. They didn't like that contract, so they walked off. But other than that, everything was going great. We're starting week two. And so Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the head armorer, shows up, and her job on that day was to get Alec a gun was either empty because he was just rehearsing or had dummy bullets in it, which are just the non, don't make a sound. They just cosmetically look like a real bullet. So what she, you got to think what she would do that morning. She got there. She said at 730 in the morning, she opened the gun safe. She got out the gun that Alec Baldwin would be using. And then she put dummy rounds in it. So remember from before, the fail-safe method for the dummy rounds are you shake them. 
no matter how many times you've shaken that dang thing, no matter how many years you've been an armorer, you just got to do it. This feels tedious and redundant. This feels tedious and redundant, but you just got to do it. She got there at 7.30, film sets take forever to do anything, and so still by lunch, they weren't ready for the gun yet, and so she said she put five dummy rounds in the gun, and then one of them wouldn't fit, and so, huh, she thought that was weird, but they go to lunch, she comes back, she cleans the thing, and then she puts a different dummy round in. I wonder if that was the fateful round who knows? So now the gun, it has what she thinks are all dummy rounds in it, which makes it more of a prop. You don't have to be quite as careful with it as one with blanks in it. They can, you know, actually shoot an explosion out. And finally, they are ready for the gun. And so she brings in the gun and gives it to either she... I've heard different things. Either she gives it to Alec right away and she says, okay, this is a cold gun, or she gives it to the director who was kind of sitting in where Alec was going to be sitting in the scene just so they can have a body sitting in. But either way, Hannah hands off what she thinks is a cold gun because of COVID. Normally the armor would sit in there during the, the scene, but because of COVID, they had her leave the church. So they're in this old rustic wooden church that the a the wood looks aged and it's these really tall arched gothic windows with the new mexico sun you know cutting into the room as it comes in the big windows there's wood crosses over the arched doorway and inside and you got a bunch of the production staff in there and the scene that they were practicing is Alex slowly pulls the revolver out of his coat and like swings it around and points it. And so they're going to planning on practicing that over and over again. So picture you have, I don't know, a handful of adults being totally silent watching. They're all doing their own little job. You have the director of um, photography, a talented woman named Helena, and you have everybody just kind of being quiet, trying to stay out of the way, letting Alec rehearse. So then he slowly pulls out the gun and boom, the thing goes off. Well, go out Hannah, the armorer, who is, you know, now outside of the church because of COVID, hears the explosion. And Sarah, the prop uh, director that was struggling, that got help from Hannah, goes, what was that? And Hannah goes, oh, it must have been a, a, a popper, which are little like special effects things you put on the wall. And I guess a couple of days or something before one went off when they didn't think it was going to. So she goes, oh, it must have been a popper. And then she hears, I mean, imagine being Hannah at like starting at this point. You were nervous about your first job with Nicolas Cage. It went completely terrible. And then you got a week off. And now here you are in the New Mexico desert. You've been here for a week. No one's happy with you. You've been yelled at several times. You can kind of tell everybody looks at you with just this like look of ugh, incompetence and horror. It's just like, it is scary. And all of a sudden, she starts hearing on the walkie-talkie everyone cares or carries around that they need a medic, and it's an emergency. And then she goes into the church, and she goes, is it the gun? And they go, yes, it was the effing gun. And she, yeah, I mean, imagine, and they hand her the gun, and she opens it up, and then it is just pandemonium. And because you... I mean, you really wouldn't think or not the first thing that a real bullet somehow made it into the movie gun onto the movie set with all of the other movie type bullets. And so they don't, all of the adults and everybody in the, in the church don't have any idea what happened. Helena, the director of photography is down. They thinking, was she hit with a rock or did something, the, the wadding come out or what is going on? She's going into shock. Alec in his interrogation goes, yeah, she went into shock. Her eyes rolled up and then the director, it went through Helena into the director, Joel. So he's like, thinks he got kicked in the shoulder and then all of a sudden he's down 
And so they don't know what happened because you're in your head, you're going, well, we pay a person where it's their full job to make sure nothing comes out. Obviously, there's no real bullets. The, you know, the director of photography and actors, you're thinking of so many other things as a scene is about to start. All right, let's capture a real moment. You don't want to think about the gun. Is it dangerous? So you pay a full salary to a person so you don't have to. They hand you the safe gun. All right, let's try to capture a real moment here. And it's just pandemonium. They call law enforcement and the body cam footage is eerie because it looks like a Western. The big New Mexico sun is there, all of the buildings. And then all of a sudden, all the real emergency type law enforcement vehicles are pulling up. So it's like new contemporary law enforcement vehicles with the sirens flashing in this old Western town in the desert. And so they're keeping Hannah away. She doesn't know still what happened or how hurt anyone is and she's just going where are the entrance wounds as she's hearing on the walkie-talkie like bring the helicopter we need to helicopter this woman out of here she's going where are the entrance wounds on these people tell me and um and it's just it's just something when hannah really knows like how bad it is and they've airlifted helena off in a helicopter Hannah is sitting there and I I think probably people screamed on there on the movie set because she has to go to the bathroom and she requests that uh well I I think that she had to actually but a female um officer accompanies her to the bathroom and she's just going you know basically like just stay with me I don't want to see any of my other co-workers can I go right back into the car when I'm done is there a closer car she just wants the law enforcement to stay around her so someone in the movie you know staff doesn't go look what you did what you 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 know she's shot she's in the helicopter so she wants to be followed around by the law enforcement she wants to go right back in the car you know she's saying things like you know i'm a failure my dad is this armorer and i did this and i mean it just like i said the her body cam footage when she before she has left the ranch really is just something else. But they take Helena to the hospital. She dies. The bullet goes under her arm and out her back. Just horrible. You think your ducks are in a row. You're the uh, director of photography on this artistic movie with Alec Baldwin. She's probably thinking everything is going up for me. And then just, you hear a bang. The last thing she probably heard was a bang, and then, and that was it. But they get Joel, who got, who took the bullet after it went through Helena in the shoulder. They get him to the hospital, and they get an x-ray pretty quickly, and you, they see it is a projectile. It's not some rock that got stuck in the barrel. Hey, a rock. It's not the wadding. And so they, they bring Hannah immediately to do an interrogation, and they bring Alec immediately they more both come off as interviews because the way I watch it, my gut feeling, it doesn't seem like any of them are trying to, either of them are trying to hide anything. Still at that point, they think it just has to be some, some bizarre mistake, a rock, something, Did a, is it a bad round? But as they show both of them, this is what's in the director's shoulder. They both go, that's a bullet. That is, how does that... How does that happen? And so they both tell the stories, the stories that I just told you right now, okay? Um, And then the other person they brought in for an interrogation is a guy named Seth Kenny, who is the person that Hannah rented guns from, some of the ammo, or I guess um, a lot of the ammo, if not all of it. But her dad, the respected armor, Thel, would also use this guy, Seth. So they brought Seth in. And Seth turned a lot of people off in his interrogation. And I think the reason is, is because he, you can tell Seth is just not happy that now this is a part of his story. It's a part of his business's story, whether he likes it or not. His business and his name is now connected with this incident. And so he is very 
he almost pretends to be a cop in the interrogation, kind of like, all right, so I don't know how we're going to deal with this, or talking to the, the interrogator, like, I don't know how you're going to deal with getting that bullet, but you're going to have to, and it's like, whoa, buddy, you're not in charge, and I don't think, I don't think with this whole story, it's either was it just horrific, horrifying negligence, or was it sabotage, something malicious, nothing that I've seen makes my gut feeling that it's sabotage or something malicious. I just keep going back to the scary negligence option. And so the, I think that there is a chance that the the real bullet in question, that's the question now, right? Where did that bullet come from? The journey of that bullet now is fascinating because it was probably made years ago. It's like Helena's Helena lived her whole life in this bullet. They're both journey, and then that faithful, well, you know, Hannah puts it into the gun. I think she forgot to shake it. That's the only thing I really think that. All right, so maybe it did come from Seth Kenny, his company. Somehow he, they were making the dummy bullets, and all right, let's make a couple real bullets to go out and shooting, and somehow one got in, or maybe it came from Hannah's dad. He's got a whole collection of probably real and movie-type bullets. So people are saying maybe if Seth's company accidentally put it in the big bundle, is it really Hannah's fault? And I just, the more I just think about it, I'm, st I'm, st I'm sorry for Hannah that she gets a lot of the blame for this one, but I just keep coming back. I think she deserves it. Even if, all right, Seth Kenny's company did completely blow it and add a fake round in, I think they could be on the other end of a lawsuit, or it maybe came from Hannah's dad, or maybe came from this or that, but the reason they hire an armorer is to shake that thing. The whole, the whole job is you got to be the last line of defense, because after... The armorer gives the actor, okay, here you go. A lot of people think, I see in the comments, it's like maybe it, it could be Alex's fault. He should have checked his own gun. I totally disagree with that. The actor's got a million other things on their mind, and that's the job of the armorer is so the actor doesn't have to. If the, if the actor was in charge of the gun safety, then you wouldn't even need, if Alec is responsible at all in my opinion it gets back to the stretching roles in the production thin because you don't have it maybe you didn't have enough money that's if you don't have enough money to do a movie then maybe you can't just do the movie i had a boss 10 years ago and he told me scott i have a get it done no matter what attitude and i was thinking in my head i hate this job so much and that get it done no matter what attitude, I get it, but if there's not enough money, you can't. it's like if you don't have enough money to do a music festival, fire festival, then you can't do one. If you don't have enough money to do a blood testing machine in a little Edison box, then you don't get a blood testing machine. That attitude of we'll just make it work, we'll stretch it thin, all right, it works, and it gets celebrated when it works out good, but you really are in trouble if... If it turns out bad. And so lawsuits are swirling right now. Um, Helena's family is suing the movie production. Hannah is suing Seth Kenny. I'm sure Seth Kenny is going to sue. Um, again, I think Seth Kenny's the reason he kind of turns people off is he really just is wants everything to be pointed at Hannah. He's going, look at Hannah, listen to Hannah. It's definitely her fault. She's incompetent, which I think he is right. But it's like, hey, Sethy boy, I know you just want this to all be gone and away from you, but we got to sit back and wait for the investigation. Maybe it did come from your company. And even if the bullet didn't come from your company, because Seth is so good friends with Fel, Hannah's dad, I think he was paramount to getting her that job. So I think all Seth wants to do is just shed the whole incident from his story and his business's story, and it's just not possible. And I think that's why he comes off in the interrogation. So I'm pretty sure the FBI is doing a full-scale investigation right now. An article came out fairly recently that said nobody in this is off the hook for criminal charges yet, so we'll sit back and wait for that. And the more I think about this one, 
the conclusion I come to is nepotism is the stuff of nightmares. It is, I mean, Hannah, immature, incompetent, Hannah, working with those guns. Oh, did I shake it? I don't know. I forgot. To me, is scarier than any villain that could be in the Western movie that they could come up with. I just feel so bad for the production crew and the other actors. You're out in the desert doing these long days and you're in the hands of Hannah Reed. It sends chills up the spine. We'll sit back and see what happens with this one. But I'm going to cut it off there. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Why? Stive and why? Shub